Hello everyone, thanks for checking out this presentation. I'm going to share six things about upgrading from .NET SDK 2 to 3 that I've learned in the process of doing my own upgrade. As a reminder, this session is pre-recorded, but if you're watching the live premiere, I'm in chat right now, ready to answer your questions at any time. These are questions I often ask myself, so I've put them in my slides to remember. I'm Matthew Groves. I've been a developer advocate here at Couchbase for over four years. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, Pluralsight author, and I have a great family. This video first premiered at Couchbase Connect 2020. If you're watching at a later time, make sure to visit connect.couchbase.com so you don't miss out on the next Couchbase Connect event. This is a picture of me back when I used to leave the house and wear suits. And this is what I look like in 2020. And it's been a rough year for all of us. Here are the six items I'll be covering today. There's a lot more to cover about the SDK design and the decisions that went into SDK 3 that I won't touch on today. So I recommend checking out the Migrating Your App to SDK 3 Connect session for more details on that. In this session, I'm just going to focus on .NET specifically and some of the major differences that tripped me up when I started converting my 2.7.x .NET code to use 3.x. First, let's talk collections and scopes. These are two new concepts in Couchbase Server for organization and or multi-tenancy purposes. I won't go into this much, so I recommend you check out other sessions at Connect that are all about this. The quick version is, Couchbase still has buckets, but buckets now contain scopes. Scopes contain collections. Scopes and collections are still in developer preview, so all you really need to know now is that there is a default collection, which I'll be using exclusively. In .NET, key value operations are now performed on the collection object, not the bucket objects. And also keep in mind that namespaces have changed. I won't point this out every time, but you can refer to the complete code sample on GitHub for details. Or you could start using a tool like ReSharper and not have to worry too much about namespaces. So let's look at a code sample. I've written a series of automated end unit tests in C Sharp to demonstrate the differences. Through most of this session, 2.7.x code will be on the left and 3.x code on the right. Here are two base classes that I've created to handle connecting to the cluster, buckets, etc., that every test will inherit from. Now let's scroll down a little more and look at this code. So notice on the left side, there are cluster and bucket properties. On the right side, there are cluster and bucket and collection properties. To connect to a cluster on the left, I instantiate a new cluster object. Give it a list of servers, authenticate it. I can then use that cluster to open a bucket. On the right, I use the new connect async static method to instantiate a cluster object. I can then get a bucket from the cluster object. And finally, I can get a default collection from the bucket. Now, I can also get a named collection, but I'll be sticking to default bucket for now. I can also get scopes from a bucket, but I'll, I'm skipping that and going straight to the default collection. These base classes will also create a nickel index if necessary and dispose the cluster during teardown. So right out of the gate, we can see some significant differences in how to connect to a cluster, the new concept of a collection, but there's one other large difference that you might have already noticed. And that's the second item. Everything is async. Some of you have been dreading this. Some of you are saying it's about time. So Microsoft's guidance with .NET is to start moving to async as much as possible. So Couchbase is following suit. As a review, 2.7.x supports both sync and async, and that will probably continue for as long as 2.7.x is supported. 3.x, just about everything that communicates with Couchbase server is async. One of the main gotchas for me on this has been that async can't be used in a constructor, so watch out for that as you're upgrading. And if you're new to async in await, I highly recommend checking out Stephen Cleary's blog and his book on C-sharp concurrency. So let's look at a code sample. 
On the left, I'm inserting two documents. First, I'm inserting synchronously. Next, I'm inserting asynchronously. On the right, I can't do this because there is no synchronous insert anymore. There's no insert, there's only insert async. And as I said before, it's a method on a collection, not on the bucket. As a side note, I'm using exists operations to verify these tests in my assertions. Exists works differently as well. In 2.7.x, it's simply a method that returns true or false. In 3.x, it returns an object of type I exists result, which has an exists Boolean member. Next on my list, using a get key value operation is different too. Remember that get is a method of collection now, not bucket. In 2.7.x, get methods have a type parameter. That is no longer the case with 3.x. Instead, you'll get an I get result object. If you wish to put the value of this result into a C-sharp object, use the content as of type T method. I think this makes it a little clearer what's actually happening. We aren't getting C-sharp objects from Couchbase, we're getting JSON, which you can then deserialize into a C-sharp object, just like any other JSON. Let's look at a code sample. On the left, my test starts by inserting a document, my favorite pizza order. Once it's inserted, I want to get it back out. So I call bucket.get and specify the pizza type. The value is in result.value. Now on the right, I start out the same way, inserting my favorite pizza order. I then call get async, which does not need a type parameter. On the next line, I can get the content and serialize it as the pizza type. I could also serialize the same JSON result to a different type if I wanted to. For instance, maybe there is a Domino's pizza class. Next, let's look at exception handling. In 2.7.x, exceptions were returned as part of the result object. They were never thrown. In 3.x, exceptions will be thrown. So for example, if you try to get a document that doesn't exist, an exception will be thrown. This is another major difference, but I think it lines up better with .NET idioms, and you'll notice something is wrong much sooner in your logic. So let's look at a code example. On the left, I'm trying to get a document by key value. But it's a unique key that I just made up, so I know it doesn't exist. This will not cause an exception to be thrown. Instead, the operation result object has a message property and an exception property, a success property, and so on which will get populated in case of an error. On the right, the first test is showing that trying to get a document by a key that doesn't exist will throw a document not found exception. So going forward, it's a good idea to use try catch to handle these exceptions. Nickel is my favorite thing about Couchbase. In 2.7.x, you can execute a nickel query on either a bucket object or cluster object. However, in 3.x, you can only execute from a cluster object. This better matches up with the Couchbase architecture because the query index services have always been separate from the data service. Plus, nickel queries are able to cross bucket boundaries for joins and such, so executing nickel against a bucket object was just a convenience method. As far as upgrading is concerned, if you need to, you can access a cluster object from a bucket object. But going forward, if you have code that's only using nickel, you don't need to get a bucket object to do so. So let's look at a code sample. On the left is an example of executing a nickel query using the cluster object. So notice the query request object. This is where you can specify scan consistency and parameters and so on. And then the query request is now passed to the query method to execute. Scrolling down to the next test, it's almost completely identical, except I'm using the query method on a bucket object instead of a cluster object. Over on the right side now, notice that there is no query request object anymore. Instead, the nickel string can be passed directly to the query method. 
Query options like parameters and scan consistency and so on are now passed in as a query options object. This is a pattern you'll see a lot elsewhere as well, and it's nice to cut down on all the overloaded methods from before. Another major difference here is related to asynchronous code. Result.rows, it's no longer a list. It's now iAsync enumerable. So, depending on your use case, you may want to loop through this collection in parallel, or use an extension method like toListAsync, which is what I've done here. Finally, let's talk about CAS, compare and swap, and concurrency. If you've not used CAS before, the short version is that it's an arbitrary value assigned to a document on Couchbase server in order to allow concurrent changes to a document from multiple processes, optimistic and pessimistic locking, in other words. In 3.x, the key value options API is more fluent, and this cuts down on a number of overloads, again, just like we saw with Nickel. There are a lot of options to cover here, but I wanna focus on CAS because there has been some confusion in the forums about this. So for instance, an upsert operation in 2.7.x, you can specify a CAS value. In 3.x, however, you cannot specify a CAS value. And let's look at an example to see why. This first example is 2.7.x code. This is a long test with multiple parts. First, I'm inserting a new document, my favorite pizza order again. Next, I'm getting that pizza order and checking that it has a CAS value. I'm not using get and lock, so this is an optimistic lock, but it's the same principle applies. So next, I'm removing the extra cheese and executing a bucket.replace while specifying a CAS value. If the document has changed in the meantime, updated by some other process perhaps, the CAS values won't match and this will cause an error. Okay, so, so far so good. Now let's scroll down and look at the rest of this test. So next, I've changed my mind. I want the extra cheese after all. But this time, instead of replace, I'm using upsert. I can again specify the CAS value here, and that will fail if the CAS value doesn't match, just like with replace. But hold on a second, there's something weird here. Upsert means update or insert, so it will change an existing document or create a brand new document. If we're creating a brand new document, then why are we still allowed to specify CAS? I'm demonstrating here with a completely made up CAS value, so this upsert will fail. This is because of some weird behavior. If I specify a CAS value in an upsert, it's actually going to try a replace, but there's nothing to replace. So I'll get an exception that the document can't be found. This isn't the end of the world, but it's a little awkward. Now let's switch over to the 3.x SDK and see how it's different. Let's go through the same process as last time. First, I'm inserting a new document, my favorite pizza order again. Next, I'm getting that pizza order and checking that it has a CAS value. Next, I'm removing the extra cheese and executing collection.replace async while specifying a CAS value in replace options. And so far, this is straightforward. There's new stuff like collection and async and replace options, but other than that, it's the same as the 2.7.x example I just showed you. Now, let's try that upsert again. I change my mind and I want extra cheese. I create an upsert options object, but now there is no CAS option available. So basically, if you want to use a CAS value, if you have a CAS value, just use replace instead of upsert. Those are the six things. I hope they help you in your migration efforts. Here are some more resources to help you take a deeper look. So start with the migration guide in the documentation. It covers many of the points I've made here today and goes into some more detail. You can check out the code samples for this session and run all those tests yourself if you want to and they're all on GitHub. And again, if you're new to async and await in .NET, I highly recommend checking out Stephen Cleary's blog and book. It'll really help you understand a lot of what's going on with async and await. And finally, don't forget that there's a .NET section 
in Couchbase's forums. If you have a question about switching to 3.x, it might have already been asked there, but feel free to ask if you have any other questions. So thank you for watching. This is a pre-recorded session, but if you're watching during the premiere, I'm standing by live to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for coming.